I'm Barry Van Veen, and I'm going to talk to you about some recent work we've been doing in modeling electrical brain networks. My expertise is in the area of signal processing, which concerns extracting information from measured data. Now, brain networks have an interesting origin because way back in the day, it was assumed that specific cognitive tasks or functions resided in localized regions of the brain. For example, we might say that agreeableness resided in this part of the brain, memory resided in this part of the brain, and love resided back here in the lower part of the brain. Of course, the advent of imaging technology in recent years has proved this not to be true. It turns out that while different parts of the brain are specialized for particular functions, in order to accomplish most tasks, we're going to have to engage an entire network of brain regions. And you can think about that as if we have a set of experts that are good at certain things, but then to do anything useful, they have to collaborate together, and that's how we accomplish a lot of cognitive tasks. When we talk about networks in the brain, we can think about networks on several different levels. The first level I want to mention is the idea of an anatomical network. And in this image here, we're showing these individual fibers are the wiring diagram, if you will, of the brain. How does each area connect to every other area? Or in an analogy to a map, they're the highways and the roads of the brain. Where can the traffic flow? What are the neural highways? And that's an anatomical network. Now, if we want to understand how the brain functions, we need to know where is the traffic and what direction does it flow? Because just knowing there's a road someplace is not near as informative as seeing the distribution of traffic at any particular point in time. So if we're going to look at functional networks, the next level of sophistication we come to is the idea of correlation networks. In this case, we say that two brain areas, say one here and one over here, are connected in a network if the activity in these two brain areas have a high degree of correlation. And correlation is a similarity measure. It tells us if activity in one area increases and the activity in another area increases in step with that, then those two areas are correlated. The downside of a correlation network is it doesn't tell us anything about cause and effect. In fact, if we look at traffic in the city of Chicago and in the city of St. Louis, and we notice that between 7 and 9 a.m., the traffic increases in both cities, and then between 4 and 6 p.m., the traffic is large again, and there's not much traffic in late at night. Well, that's just a third effect. That's the effect of rush hour. It's not to say that the traffic in St. Louis and in Chicago are interacting in any sense at all. So the ideal network model for the brain would include the idea of cause and effect, and that is be directional. So we'd have the idea that one region of the brain down here is causing something to happen in another region. Now, cause and effect is notoriously difficult to establish. However, we're going to use an engineering approach and borrow some ideas from uh, Clive Granger, who was inspired by Norbert Wiener, to use temporal precedence, and that is to rely on the common sense notion that the cause must precede the effect. How do we do this? Well, let's take an example. If I have a brain region with activity x2 of t, and here I'm letting t represent time, so this tells me how the activity in this region is changing with time, and I have another brain region with activity x1 of t, and if x2 is causing something to happen in x1, then we're going to say that x1 at time t is a function of its past activity, its own history. It's also a function of the past activity in x2. So the past of x2 influences the present of x1, and we're going to call that a causal relationship as an operational definition. Now, to do this, we have to measure our brain activity with a high time resolution. And one technology 
that has very high TEM resolution is that of electroencephalography or EEG. An EEG involves measuring the electric fields at the scalp. Now there's electric currents that flow in between the synapses when your brain is active and those electric currents generate electric fields. And because we're sampling those fields directly, we can measure them with very high time resolution. Milliseconds is commonly used. The downside is that because we're measuring the electric field at the scalp, where the currents that we're interested in are flowing down in the brain, we get this blurring. If I have a localized source of current in one part of the brain and another localized current in a different region of the brain, when I look at the scalp, the activities I see due to both of those are going to overlap and there's going to be some potential confusion. So to do our analysis of a network model from EEG data, we have to account for the physics of scalp measurement. How does the skull and the shape of the head change the electric field from that of the original current source? So we've got two steps. We're going to account for the physics. We're also going to then try to use a model to describe the directed interactions between cortical regions of interest. We'll set this up as an optimization problem, and it looks something like I've shown on this slide. We have X is a vector that contains the cortical signals that's in the brain, the signals we're interested in, as a function of, say, time n, and those signals are dependent on past values of the cortical signals, x of n minus k, through a matrix of interaction parameters that we're going to denote as ak. Now, because we can't measure the cortical signals, none of these are available to us. What we get to see is the measured EEG, and we're going to call that a vector y at time n, and that depends on the cortical signals through the physics of the measurement process, as well as some additional noise. And so our goal is to observe the measured EEG y of n, and knowing something about the EEG physics, we want to identify these interaction parameters. And we've developed an iterative algorithm that will solve that problem for us. It only is guaranteed, however, to converge to a local optimum solution. So we're going to start this iterative algorithm with many different initial guesses and then evaluate the results obtained by each of those and pick the very best one. Now this is a problem that's ideal for high throughput computing. And to show you that, let's take a scenario where we're going to analyze multiple subjects. You know, each of those subjects can be assessed in parallel. Each subject typically is going to have multiple experimental conditions, which also can be analyzed in parallel. And then recall for our optimization algorithm, we have to start it at many different initial conditions. So the results for each initial condition can also be computed in parallel. And then we select the best result of those initial conditions. And if you look at the number of parallel jobs we have, it's multiplicative. It's J subjects times K experimental conditions times M initial conditions. And for a reasonable measurement scenario, it's very easy to get thousands of jobs. And I've put some numbers down here that'll give you 3,000 jobs that can be run in parallel. Now each job is typically going to take several CPU hours for the type of algorithm that we use. And so if you had 3,000 jobs to run, that would take you 6,000 hours, which is about 250 days. And that's not an acceptable turnaround time for work like this. So we've, with the help of the Center for High Throughput Computing here on campus, ported our algorithms to run on the open science grid and using many, many, many processors running in parallel, we can get a typical three-day turnaround for a set of jobs like this. And we're pretty heavy users of these kind of capabilities. From July of 2013 to July of 2014, we used 2.4 million hours, which comes out to 274 years of computing time. I'm going to illustrate this work with a couple examples of studies that we've done. And all these studies have been in collaboration with other researchers here on campus.
So the first one I'm going to talk about is working memory, or a study of the networks involved in short-term memory, like when you remember a phone number while you're dialing it. And so the task that the subjects were asked to do was to remember the locations and colors of objects in an array for about a second, and then they were tested with a probe to see if they remembered correctly or not. Now, we did a number of different studies of this type of memory, but the one I want to highlight here has to do with how do brain networks change when there's a distraction present. Our hypothesis was that there would be additional top-down control, and in the brain, by top, we mean the more frontal regions of the brain, and down here, we're referring to the sensory regions of the brain where inputs arrive from the, say, visual system, which is in the back here, this pink area. We compared a scenario where the subjects had to remember two objects versus a scenario where they had to remember two objects with distracting objects present and looked at 30 subjects, and we built a six-node network using six regions of the brain that are known to be active in working memory, and that's a frontal region depicted in orange, this parietal region depicted in blue, and then the occipital region depicted in pink. We compared the strength of the connections between these different regions with and without distraction. So in this bar graph down here, we've got the connections with distractions in red, and the connections without distraction, the strengths in blue. And I've highlighted the three connections that were showed statistically significant changes. And I've indicated those three connections as the red arrows on the simple network diagram on the right. And so you can see that the frontal, the orange, and the parietal, the blue, regions are having stronger sets of interaction with themselves as well as with the occipital region when there's these distractions present. That makes sense because the, managing the distraction is a higher cognitive load and it requires more involvement of frontal regions. Now this sort of thing makes sense to us but hasn't really been shown before because of the lack of tools for doing this kind of analysis. So we're pretty excited about the potential for these kind of network models. The other example I want to refer to is a test of a theory of consciousness, integrated information theory, proposed by one of my colleagues here at Wisconsin, Giulio Tononi. In brief, that theory says that the level of consciousness depends on the complexity of the network interactions in the brain. We took some data that was actually measured in the brain of some epilepsy subjects, and we compared the networks that we identified in wake, when they'd be conscious, to those that we identify in non-REM sleep, which would be an unconscious state. And using from eight to 12 locations, so a fairly small network when you consider the 80 billion neurons that are likely to be in the brain, we found that indeed there was evidence that the network complexity is much higher in wake than it was in sleep. And this held across multiple subjects in multiple conditions. So that was very encouraging and that's something we're pursuing further. So in conclusion, my interests have been in developing algorithms for modeling brain networks. And I see this as a tool to enable science to learn more about the brain. In order to perform this work, we have to have accessibility to high throughput computing. It just wouldn't be possible any other way. And that need is going to increase as we move forward with more complex paradigms involving combinations of multiple modalities. I'd like to thank my sponsors of this work and the collaborators and postdocs and graduate students that I've had the privilege of working with.